Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ married Aisha when she was nine. The contract was when she was nine. And then the actual marriage happened when she was 11. Now this is a saying by one man. And this is in Bukhari. But there is another hadith in Bukhari. And go and check it. That Aisha says, I recognized my parents always as Muslims. I've never seen them non-Muslims. And I recognize that. Ma aqil walidayya illa wa huma muslima. I would recognize, I understood that they are always Muslim. Wa dhalika inda hijrati al-Muslimina ila al-Habasha. And I, I had this full recognition at the time Muslims migrated to Abyssinia. This is in Bukhari. Now a question to you. When would a child recognize religion? Usually five years old, minimum, maybe seven, eight, but in that range, but not two or three. Now, she's, she gave us the date. This is at the time when Muslims migrated to Abyssinia. It is a unanimous agreement by all historians, no exception, that the migration of Muslims to Abyssinia happened in the fifth year of the message of Islam. That is before he went to Medina. This was still in Mecca. Five years after the start of Islam, the migration happened. So she was at least five years old when the migration happened. And this is in Bukhari, I'm not making anything up. So if we assume the minimum, and she is five, then by the time of Hijrah to Medina, migration to Medina, happened eight years later, unanimously, no exception. So by that time, she was at least 13 years old. And she was married after Hijrah in two years. So she was at least 15 years old. So come on, she hit me. You cannot take that story narrated by someone and consider it history. There's another proof that unanimously, no disagreement, that her sister Asma was 28 years old when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. And if you know the story, you know that she helped her, helped her and his father to migrate. It's very well known. And unanimously, she was 28 years old. And unanimously, the difference in age between Asma and Aisha is 10 years. Unanimously, there's no, no disagreement. So she was 18, and she was married two years after that. So she was 20. So don't play with our religion. Simple, huh? Let's go back to the original sources. Leave the tradition and the misunderstandings of scholars. Three major sources that will stop and hinder our work to revive this great ummah and reach our bright history that I just, I mean future that I just described to you. The first one is dictatorships. And alhamdulillah, we're getting rid of them one by one. <laughs> but we still have a huge struggle to do. The second one, which is huge, is financial corruption. Sucking our blood. I was with uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, and he tells me that when he was in charge of the municipality of Istanbul, in the first year, he was able to save $20 billion just by stopping corruption. And that is one city. 
Just imagine how much corruption in the Gulf states where I come from. Really amazing. Yani. These people are never satisfied. And we cannot, we cannot build our education and health and so while uh, we, we have, a, excuse me for this, we have a joke that um, three people were talking about corruption. So a Frenchman, he said, we have corruption in Paris. And uh, he, 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 they were traveled to Paris and he said, look at this bridge. It took five years to build while it should have been only three. So there was corruption. And then another person from Finland, he said, we also have corruption. And he took them to Finland and said, look at this bridge. It took two years. Well, it should have been one year and a half only. So the rest was corruption. So a man from the Arab countries, <laughs> I would not specify which one, <laughs> he said, we have corruption. Let me show you. So they go to his country, and he said, see this bridge costed $100 million. They said, which bridge? Which bridge? <laughs> there was no bridge. <laughs> so that is, you're laughing. This is serious, wallahi. Major projects, nothing done, zero. So how can you build a civilization or reach the bright future that we're looking for when you have this corruption? The third kind of resistance that we face and will continue to face, unfortunate, is our scholars, the traditional scholars that see what we present and we use it with logic and we use it with proofs but they see this as a threat to religion so they reject it and fight against it and call us all different kinds of names but I want to give you the good news that wallahi see I I, I am with the young generation I'm always with the young generation everywhere from uh, Canada, I trained them to Australia, all over the Arab world and Muslim world. Wallahi, a huge percentage of the youth are with this dream and with this understanding of Islam. So I assure you that we are winning this battle. Barakallah <laughs> fikum. Two thousand and nine, I was in. Uh, I finished with this story. Two thousand and nine, I was in Germany, and I was meeting with the uh, uh, chairman of the major think tank that does the strategic planning for the parliament and the government of Germany. Very wise, very knowledgeable gentleman who speaks seven languages. Among them is Arabic fluently. This is 2009. So we were a delegation, some of them from the Ministry of uh, Islam, uh, Islamic Affairs, some of them from the Islamic Development Bank, etc. So they started to talk. So when it came my turn, I said, look, I have, alhamdulillah, no official position. I don't represent any government, so I can speak freely. I can speak freely. You see this? Muslim and Arab world, within few years, it will be governed by moderate Islam. Nobody can stop that. So I have an advice for you. We are now weak. So let us agree now. Because when we're strong, we will put our conditions. So he laughed whispered to his assistant, started to say a few words. Later on, came with a booklet, a study. 
and he gave me a copy of it. And the study says, yes, the Muslim world will be governed by moderate Islam. They know it. They have to deal with it. My, my wish is for you, Muslims and non-Muslims, old and young, we are for a dream that will make humanity happen, happy. So let us all work together on this. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Shukran. <clears throat> See, the word deen is wrongly translated into religion because they didn't have any other word to translate it. If you know Arabic deeply, then you understand that deen comes from the verb dana. Dana ya deenu deen, deenan. What is dana? Dana me means you made a judgment. Dana means you made a judgment. And that is why, sorry, for example, when a judge makes a judgment on a criminal, we say, Adana. Adana. Because he made a judgment upon him. And also in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that on the day of judgment, what do we call the day of judgment? The day al-akhirah, the hereafter. Yawmuddin. Yawmuddin. This is in Fatiha. Is it Yawmuddin, if you translate it, that like people tra do translations, it is the day of religion? <laughs> Come on, what, is, what does it mean, the day of religion in the hereafter? It is the day of judgment. It is the day of judgment. That's what makes sense. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't make sense that it's a day of religion. You cannot translate it that way. So the word deen in Arabic is the judgment. And what kind of judgment? 
judgment on all issues. So that is the essence of Islam. It is the religion that gives the judgment on all issues. But when you translate it into English, for example, as religion, and people are in the context of understanding religion by looking at Christianity, Judaism, and others, then they will understand it wrongly. So Islam, again, is the, the, the system of judgment on